welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. Let's pray. Let's go before God. Would you stand? This is what we do here at the Rock. We want to honor the word of God. And so we're going to go before God. Let's pray. Father God, humbly we come before you, all of us honoring you, Lord. Holy Spirit, you've been in our midst. You've been with us. You're going to do, continue to do something amazing. We open our hearts to receive your word. Father, we don't come here to hear from a man or a woman or the young or the old or, or cultural backgrounds. Father, we come to hear directly from your word. So Holy Spirit, come and teach us. You are the teacher of the church. So we open our hearts to hear your word. May it be planted in our hearts and bring forth much fruit. We believe that tonight, Father. Lord, just as you bless us here at The Rock, we also pray that you bless the other churches around the world and in the Empire. Lord, we don't consider ourselves better than any of them, but we believe we're co-labor, advancing the kingdom of God with them. Lord God, that's our prayer every time we meet because we believe that together we'll reach the Inland Empire, Father. So now bless your word and bless us. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. You may be seated. To put it a title tonight, um, there's a, a word that came to my heart, which is personal revival, personal revival. And I know the word revival maybe sounds uh, maybe weird to some people. Revival uh, might give you the connotation of, um, you know, just kind of this out crazy Pentecostal charismatic event where people are running up and down and there's all kinds of stuff. That's the idea a lot of times people have in their minds of revival, but revival is a great thing. Many churches, the gospel has been spread through many uh, moments of revival. If you look at church history, even church history within the U.S., the most famous one, which is the Azusa revival, just down the 10 freeway, just down that direction, you head to Azusa and you probably have seen the greatest revival in the last hundred years happened just a few miles from here. And so the gospel spread from that event and it grew. But there's something that I believe God has been threading through our church in the last few days. Pastor Luke talked about, I believe it was him, uh, Martha and Mary. And then Pastor Dan gave us a call to join near, letting the word affect us and dissect us. And so when I was reading this, I just started to see that God is trying to work in us for a personal revival. Listen, church, many churches pray for revival. God, we need a revival. God, we want a revival. But I want you to know that unless there is a personal revival, there will never be a church revival or citywide or nationwide. There will never be. It always starts with the person. It always starts with the person. So if that's the case, where are we at? Where's our life? And it's very important for us to know and check our own life. And I want you to know that I'm not preaching at you, but this starts with me. Pastor Dan, I believe, read Psalm 51. And as I'm reading the psalm, it's a very famous psalm, and we're going to look at a few verses here. I just want to stay there. Um, I want to start with the verse that captured my heart. Very famous verse, and that is Psalm 51, 12. Psalm 51, 12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. That word to me just captured me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. David is here claiming or wanting something that he lost. It's like many of us suffer a midlife crisis in Christianity where we sort of need to do, uh, you know, the typical midlife crisis and man is very talked about. It's sort of Christianity is the same way. We go on our Christian walk and all of a sudden we need something a little more edgy to get us going. We need something a little extra to kind of top it off because otherwise this Christian walk, the daily grind just doesn't cut it anymore. Are you with me? And so David finds himself in that condition. Many people, this psalm was written according to all theologians, uh, was written after David had committed sin with Bathsheba. Pastor Dan very well explained it because she was taking a bath, Bathsheba. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, but he, he wrote this psalm after this event. And so he's saying, hey, listen, God, I need you to do something, but I want you to hear me. I believe David felt out of Christian fire before he committed the sin. See, he's not saying, restore to me the joy of your salvation, even though anywhere you read it, any commentary you read will tell you he wrote this because he's in sin. 
I believe differently. I believe he was no longer challenging his Christian walk. Therefore, he was living a mundane, boring, unchallenged life. And so he just walked right into something edgy, something different, something that challenged me because I'm no longer in love with God. Here's the guy who used to play the harp and instruments and worship God in the hills of Judea. And he would do anything for the Lord. Had a tremendous faith. And all of a sudden, you find him not in that condition. Now, if you read in 2 Chronicles, I believe, where it kind of talks about this. And in Samuel, talks about his life in Samuel prior to this event. You read, and for the next three chapters before you arrive where he sins with Bathsheba, it was so interesting. He had beaten Every single king around Israel. I mean, not just like, you know, hey, I took a few guys. He whooped them. I mean, he just took out 10,000, 60,000, 20,000. He just eliminated everybody. He was the man. And the following verse says, when the kings go to war, David stay home. It was nothing challenging. It was nothing challenging. God restored to me. The joy of your salvation. Remember those days when you first became a Christian? We couldn't get you out of this building. I mean, you couldn't stay out of church. You wanted the next service, the next group. You wanted to know when to serve. How can I serve? How many hours would they allow me to clean around here? Oh, my gosh, what a privilege. I'm cleaning the church. I'm guessing that's long gone around here in some places. but <laughs> So David finds himself in this exact condition when you to me when he writes his verses he's lost it he he no longer has a commitment to his walk with god see joy of salvation can be lost by two things that i've noticed in in my time in the gospel and people like me pastor luke pastor jessica some of us have been in the gospel a long time since we were kids my own wife pastor Joe, many of us has just we've grown up in church this is all we've known it comes to a point where it becomes common it becomes common I'm telling you. And so for some of you guys who have an impacting testimony, God saved me from drugs and this. You want me to tell the truth? Maybe they don't, but uh, not that they won't tell the truth. Maybe it's not their desire. Uh, but in my heart, I remember I was a teen. I was like, I wish I had a cool testimony, man. I, I did this, and I, you know, I took out some guys. And yeah, the Lord rescued me. You wanted something cool because all you could say is, well, I go to church since I was five years old because my mom took me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So, so there was no joy attached to what we were doing. It was just life. David is the guy who was always there. David is a guy who had a connection with God. That's all he knew. But he had, finds himself saying, God, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Bring back to me a personal revival. Bring to my heart a personal revival. Deuteronomy, 20, Deuteronomy 28, 47 says something so interesting. Before God blesses them, he, Deuteronomy 20, he talks about the blessing and the cursing. If we do not follow, if Israel did not follow what God wanted them to do, but, to do, but this verse is so amazing. It says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Now, you may say, Pastor, what's the abundance of what? There's an economical crisis. We don't have money. We don't have this. But we have plenty of stuff to do. We have so many options from, from TV to sports to different things. There's everything coming at us. And out of the abundance of what we do, God gets in the way. God gets in the way. It's no longer these other things are getting in the way of God. But we flip it and say, man, I have to break what I do in order to accommodate church when we say that we're walking away from personal revival from personal revival and god wants us to stay connected in personal revival our salvation should be connected to a joyful event a lifestyle a joy now i'm not talking about you being happy go lucky all the time if that's your personality that's great and that's wonderful there's nothing bad with that so you say pastor my personality is not a happy go lucky i'm not talking about personality i'm talking about a true internal commitment and joy to remain a christian to remain in god to continue to serve God, I want you to know that in no other time in my walk with God in my life have I ever seen such a pressure and push to ridicule who we are. 
So it's really hard for you to walk up to somebody and say, I'm a Christian, because you don't want them to have in their mind what you already think they have. Are you following me? David didn't care. See, when David went up to the Philistines and, and, Goli and Goliath was there, he just, he didn't care. He said, who are you? What are you talking about? I'm going to take you out. There was a boldness in David because he trusted God. He understood what was in his heart. And God wants to restore that in all of us. God wants to restore the fire that you wake up in the morning and love your children. And you're going to fight for your family. And you're going to get into church. And you're going to do the things that you did to stay in a personal revival with God. It's so important for us to stay in that condition, in that position. Psalms 13.5, I'll read it for you. It says, but I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. That's what David is talking about. I want to rejoice in your salvation. I want to have that joy of life in me. So let's look at Psalm 51. If you have your Bible, get it in there, Psalm 51. Put your little rib in there on Psalm 51 because we're going to look at a few verses back and forth. But we're going to look at many verses. And Psalm 51 gives us a description of something David did in this prayer to reignite himself into a personal revival. So starting my personal revival, what do I have to do to start my personal revival today? Number one thing I see David do, he confessed. David brings a confession. To start my personal revival, I have to confess. Now, people look at confession as a negative thing, okay? I'm not talking about a forced confession. Actually, I'm going to ask forgiveness from my police friends that are here. Please don't get offended beforehand, right? But it's not a forced confession that we're talking about. You know, the president, um, the president decided to test who was the best, best investigator there was so he hires the cia the fbi and lapd okay and so the cia goes in and says hey i want you to find a rabbit in the forest cia goes in get some other informants little animal creature vegetable whatever they can find to become an informant three months later they come in and say we can't locate the rabbit but intel is still coming in all right so the FBI goes in and, and says, we'll get them for you. They go in, get their informant. Two weeks later, they came find us. So they burned the whole wilderness. Forget it. Forget the rabbit and tell the president he had to come in anyway. So they clean up house. But the LAPD goes in and says, it's not our turn. So they go in and three hours later, they come back with a bear yelling, I'm a rabbit. I'm a rabbit. I hope that's not true, but <laughs> confession is not negative. Like the spiritual police are trying to make you say or do something you don't want. See, confession is just looking at yourself and saying, I'm not there, God, and I got to get back there. I, I'm asking for your forgiveness. I'm asking I'm admitting to what I've done in order to get back there. Don't blame it on other people. Don't blame it on the church. Don't blame it on the pastor said. Don't blame it on so-and-so said that verse. I saw on TV when it, at the bottom line, when you and I died, it's up to us to go before God and say, this is what I did with my life, Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? So confession is personal responsibility. Not a negative thing, but David said, you know what, Lord? I fell out of love with you, so now I have to come back and just tell you how I feel. And let you know what's going on. If you look at verse number 6 out of Psalm 51. Verse number 6 says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. He said, Lord, look at this. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. Inward parts. Say, I desire truth. And so does God. It's got to be a desire, and you're saying, Lord, I desire truth, so I'm going to tell you where I'm at in my life and in my walk. Unless you and I do that, we cannot restore our relationship. We cannot start personal revival. As a matter of fact, if you study revival, it always starts with people walking away from sin. Always. Any revival you look in history, any revival you're studying, it starts with people on fire saying, I'm no longer going to get mixed with this. I'm going to draw a line. I'm going to follow God, and I'm not going to do X, Y, Z. Are you with me? 
And so David did that. David said, I am drawn a line because you desire truth in my in inward parts. Not just the vocal truth. Sometimes we're very apt to just say truth in public and sometimes be a little more hidden in private. But God already saw you. He knows you. He loves you. We just sang that his love will never run out on you. But he desires that you say truth in inward parts. That you are truthful to what you're saying on the inside of you. Are you with me? It's so important for us to do that, for us to, to be like David. There's a message in the book of Revelation. If you go there, Mark, Psalm 51, book of Revelation. Um, it's famous, famous sequence called the message to the seven churches. Message to the seven churches. A famous sequence that when you read Revelation speaks of many things. I'm not going to talk about the interpretation, but um, there's a message to a church called Ephesus that is so powerful because... These verses I'm going to read are not on the screen for you, but I hope you brought your Bible. Then you'll see some of them on the screen. But this is what the angel says. The angel starts speaking. This is the message to Ephesus. It says, verse 2, I know your works, chapter 2, verse 2. We're going to read later, 4 and 5. I'll have on the screen for you. But let me start on, on verse 2. It says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say that are apostles and are not and then have found in liars. Now, stop right there. If you read verse 2... Wouldn't you say that's a great church? Let me read it again, just so you have no doubt. I know your works. Ooh, they're working hard. I know your labor. They're working. They're patient. I know you cannot bear those who do evil and test those who say there's something they're not. I'll tell you what. I want to be in that church. I mean, that church is, is going places. They're doing something amazing. But it keeps describing everything they do. I want you to go to verse 4 right now. Chapter 2 says, nevertheless, nevertheless. I, I, I don't want that said about me. I don't want it to be said, man, I, you're amazing. You're doing great things. You're going places. Nevertheless, there, there's that thing that is just like, what's the nevertheless? What do you mean? I'm doing what you're asking me to do. And here's what God tells the church of Ephesus. Are you with me? says, I have this against you. You have left your what? You have left your first love. You have left your first love. You walked away from those things that were amazing to you. You walked away from a heart that no matter who preached or who sang, you were willing to absolutely sing whatever because you knew it was for God. You walked away from your first love. Once again, it's a challenge for me before it is for you. If you want to take it for you, go for it but I want to take it for me. I want to go back to that event when, when nothing bothered me. When we have childlike hearts, now we get offended because we're adult Christians. When I was a child of God, I, I couldn't even tell if you had offended me. You remember those days? Somebody said something. It was like, well, it sounds like an interesting verse. I'm offending you, but since you can't get it. You get what I'm saying? There was, a, there was a sensitivity in our hearts that is all of a sudden becomes, he's saying, you walked away from your first love. Verse number five, remember therefore. Remember therefore. Pastor Jim is always thought, of, therefore is there for a reason. So because I just told you you walked away from your first love, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Oh, man, what an amazing thing. See, a lot of people see it as a terrible warning. You're horrible. You walked away. But that's not what the angel's saying. The angel's saying, I've seen all the great things you do, but I need something else from you. I need you that you continue to do that. But do it in your first love. Do it in the desire that you were fired up to do whatever God asked you to do. You had come into that place. Are you with me? So he's saying, repent, confess whatever have kept you away from, your, from my first love, and go back to it. Go back to that event in your life where nothing was too heavy or burdensome for you to do because you were doing it for God. Are you with me? And so he's asking that. But he says, repent. And I like that expression that says, therefore, from where you have fallen. Now, I want you to, read, I want you to understand what this is saying. Because in verse 2 and 3, he's saying, you're amazing. You're a great church. You're doing great works. And then it says, but you've fallen. Meaning that you can do a lot, but unless you're in love with God, it's actually a step down. It's actually a step down. And it says, I need you to step up back to first love. Continue to do what you do, 
but step up to first love. And that begins with saying, I'm not there, God, and I need to go back to that moment in my life. Are you with me? And number two, <clears throat> starting my personal revival, number two, I have to, second thing I have to do, I have to accept. That's all tough word for me except <laughs> except what his work in us his love for us once you've made a confession now you have to receive the love of God in your in your heart the Bible says that he gave out of love guys God is not mad at you he's not trying to find you in fault and beat you up and many people walk away from God because they're not connected in that love and David is saying I, I acknowledge I acknowledge I'm repenting and I acknowledge now I have to accept what God is doing for me he actually confesses Psalm 51 10 51.10, remember, we're going to go back there. Psalm 51.10 says a famous verse that most of you guys will know. says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew steadfast spirit within me. He says, God, I receive, I, I confess what I've done now. I receive that you have to create some things in my heart, that you have to work in me. See, people need a revelation of, God love, of God's love because that's going to help them stay connected with God. Are you with me? It's going to help them stay connected with God. Ephesians 3 says something so interesting. Ephesians 3, I want you to go there. Sorry we're jumping a lot in verses. I just... If you can't track it's okay just read them on the screen i just feel i have to share these verses for us tonight ephesians 3 17 through 19 i have the new living translation the new living translation it says then this is a prayer a prayer that paul was making for the churches and he's saying then christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him your roots will grow down into god's love and keep you what keep you what go down into the love of God and keep you strong. That is the place where you and I will remain strong. Guys, if we don't get a revelation of God's love, and I know a lot of people say, oh, you can't preach about God's love to men. I'm sorry. That is the expression God chose to reveal himself for God so loved the world. It is not a men thing or a female thing. It is not a feeling. It is an action. There's no greater love than one who lays out his life for someone else. No greater love. And so until we remain distant from that, we're not going to remain in the gospel. I am convinced that a lot of people walk away from the gospel because they don't have a revelation of God's love. And that is exactly why Paul is saying, I'm praying for you that you, your roots will grow deep into the love of God. Grow deep into the love of God. So that it will keep you what? It will keep you strong. When you have the revelation, it'll keep you strong. When you mess up, you know he still loves you. You understand what I'm saying? When you walk into the sanctuary and don't feel holy enough to raise your hand, he still loves you. It never runs out. It never runs out. He wants you to stay there. But you have to grow in God's love. And David had done that for many years. For many years. Verse 18 says, And you, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. He's saying, I'm praying that you get it. I'm praying that you understand it. I'm praying that it gets into your head how big the love of God is. You have to get it. Verse 19 says, I love this, may you experience the love of Christ. So he said, you need to grow roots in it. You need to understand it. And now you know, now you need to experience it. You get, you're tracking with Paul? He's saying, be rooted and grounded in him. Comprehend his love, your version might say. And then it says, to know his love. And that knowledge is intimate, intimate knowledge. To know God's love. It says that you may experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made, say that word with me, What? complete then you will be made complete you and i cannot be complete until we understand the fullness of god until it grows in our hearts with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from god and the power that comes from god the regular version says that you may be filled with all the fullness of god is god big five of you believe it amen thank you 
And it says, I want you to be completely full of God. Think about that. Give it a thought. Give it a minute. Don't get distracted. I know we're in a hyper society where you have to flip the phone and do all kinds of stuff. Just, just simmer in this. He wants you to be full of God. Full. And for us to experience a personal revival, there's going to have to come a fullness of God in our heart. There's going to have to come a, we're legit, we're the real deal, we are who we are, we're in Christ, we have approved of his love, and it's absolutely filling our hearts in every area of our life. There's no other way around it. There's no other way around it to stay in this. Very important. Starting my personal revival. Number three, starting my personal revival. I need to obey. I need to obey. And I know obedience is one of those things, too, in the gospel, especially in our society, that has a, a really terrible connotation. It's like, oh, I, I need to obey now. You're my teacher. Now you're going to tell me what to do. And, and so people get finicky when you throw the word obey in church. It's like people get uncomfortable. They're trying to find which is the best. See, see, the ushers are checking them out so they can walk out. And relax, okay? <laughs> obedience is part of the process. It's part of what we do. Obey is important because what God is saying is, I can tell you a million things. You can sit there in a million messages. Hear me well. You can sit there tonight and say, well, it's a wonderful message, Pastor. I'm so glad you preached it. It's all I need to walk away and ignore everything I said. You've done nothing. Because without a corresponding action, Knowledge is just information in space. Without corresponding action, knowledge is information in space. That's all there is to it. All you've done is you've accumulated some verses, some great information, laughed at a few jokes, and stayed at that level. And I believe when I heard Pastor Luke preach it and Pastor Dan preach it, and now God spoke to me through that verse, God is wanting a corresponding action to what we're hearing. God, we're going after you. We're growing in you. Unless it grows in me, it will never be outside of me. It will never be outside of me unless he grows inside of me. And that's so crucial for us to know in our Christian walk, that's where it's at. It boils down to an inward transformation with an outward manifestation. It comes with an inward transformation with an outward manifestation. There is no other way around it. No other way. You can have it here, but you won't have it in practice. I remember when I was in college, there was a class called Big old name, pathology, basically just means the study of sicknesses. And so, um, you know, we're studying all this other stuff, and the exam was crazy hard. I'm now, I can remember a lot of information, but I'm more of a, uh, you know, I can, I can remember what I see, but I have a hard time remember just reading. And the exam was you had to look at a microscope, identify the type of sickness that was in the microscope, whether it be cancer, liver, whether it be a, a slice of the heart after a cardiac arrest. It would, they just give you all these slices. So you had to fill this stuff out. Now, that was easy. I will look at it and say, this is what it is. This is what it is. I mean, 8 out of 10, 10 out of 10. Then came the other part. I had to describe it and give a diagnosis for it. And that's where I failed. Because I could process information a certain way, but did not take the time to put it in me in order to become an our expression. Are you with me? Probably not relating to what I'm saying, but uh, basically what I'm saying is I could see it with my eyes. I could see what I wanted, but I couldn't convey it on paper because it wasn't inside of me. In the same way, you come into church and say, I see his life. I see his marriage. I see what they have. You can see what you want, but it's not being manifested out of you because it's not being put into practice. It's not an outward expression. And that's what obedience is all about. <clears throat> Psalm 51, 12 says, Restore to me, I'm reading the New Living Translation, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Another translation says, give me a willing heart, a willing heart. David said, not only do I want to be saved, not only do I want to be happy again in my salvation, Lord, but I want to have a willing heart to do what you're asking me to do. Guys, joy is going to come when there's willingness for us to do something. Willingness. We all remember when we were kids, and maybe some of us husbands still have to do it till our kids get older, we had to take out the trash when it was trash day, right? If 
five of you guys do it? Uh, ladies, get your guy to take out the trash. <laughs> I'm counting the days when my son turns 11 because it's going to be his job. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but for many of us, there was that thing in us that we had to do something. We had to do something. But there were certain jobs around the house and in our lives that we enjoy doing. Are you with me? And when you enjoy doing it, nobody has to ask you twice. I'll do that. I'll do X or Y. And in my house with our kids, my wife is training them a lot to do chores and do things around the house. And the ones they get paid for, I mean, you can't line them up fast enough, okay? I'll vacuum. I'll clean. I'll do the bathroom because some dollars are coming their way. When there's a certain benefit, all of a sudden you have a joy. But God is saying, restore to me, David is saying, the joy of your salvation. I just want to be happy in the fact that I'm saved. Even if you don't bless me, even if you don't give me a car or a house or, or a job, I'm just happy that you saved me. I'm just happy that I'm not heading to hell. I'm just happy that there's something good for me, spiritual benefit for my children and family. God, just restore that joy back to me once again. Restore that back to me. And that comes with a willingness of heart, a willingness of heart. Willing to obey equals non-rebellious. Willing to obey equals non-rebellious. I don't want you to go here, um, but Second Chronicles 25, 1 and 2 has a story of a king that's so amazing. And this verse really captured my heart. It says, Messiah was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother name was well, that's a hard name, Jehoden of Jerusalem. Verse number two is where I want to go. It says, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. Say what? When I read that verse, I was like, nah, nah, that verse is, is wrong. It should say he did what was good for God and his heart was absolutely joyful. Wouldn't you think? And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. Guys, this is the reality that David found himself. You can do a lot of great things in the gospel and not have a heart for God. And this is why personal revival is so important for all of us. Personal revival is crucial for any one of us because you can do a lot of things and your heart may not be in it for God. And hear it from me, somebody who's been in church all his life and you think it'll be easier for me, it's actually harder for me. It's harder for me. It's actually harder for us who work on staff. Maybe they won't say it. I'll say it for myself. But many times when you're staffed in a church, you're in church 24-7. And sometimes you may confuse being in the building with being with God. And they're two complete different things. Two complete different things. But God wants you to be here because in this building, in this meeting, he's going to speak to you. And he's going to speak to your heart and to your life. But you have to have a loyal and willing heart. A loyal and willing heart. I'm not trying to be harsh, but I'm trying to be honest with you and honest with myself. I don't want to play church. I really don't care about playing church. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not putting on a show. I'm just letting you know that I want a personal revival. I cannot walk my life with God unless I have a true personal revival in my own heart. In my own heart. As a pastor and as a leader, let alone leading others to do the same. Philippians 1, 5, and 6, Paul once again praying to the church. And it always amazes me because Paul is always praying for the transformation of the church. And Paul loved the church of Philippi because in Philippi, Paul went in, preached the gospel. People came to Christ. But like he's done in other churches, he would usually stay there and plant the church and build leadership. In this case, Paul had to leave because he was on his way somewhere else. So Philippi was just passing by. And he loves them because they were so true young Christians. So he writes them back. And in his writing, he said, I am always praying for you. And this is what I pray. I pray for you. And then verse 5, chapter 1 of Philippians says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul says, I'm always praying for you from the first day you walked, you came to Christ until today. I want you to continue in the fellowship of God. Are you with me? Then jumps to verse 6 and says, being confident. 
Say that with me. One, two, three. Being confident. Being confident of what? Of this very thing. That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. <laughs> until the day of Jesus Christ. See, Paul wants you to know and be confident that God is not going to leave you halfway. God is not going to say, man, you've made it up to here, but I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ship because there's no way I'm changing you. That's not what he's doing. Paul says, you have to be confident that if he, he began, he's going to finish it. The problem is he cannot finish the work unless you're here. Unless, not, unless you're in the gospel. You with me? Unless you're in the gospel, it's kind of hard to finish something if you don't show up to do it. So he's saying, be present. Be obedient. Have a willing heart. But be confident that I'm going to complete what I've started in your heart. I'm going to transform it to the very end. Are you with me? Starting our personal revival, we've seen three things so far, which is I want, God wants us to confess, God wants us to accept, and God wants us to obey. Can you handle one more? Starting, well, if you said no, I'm going to do it anyways, but that's okay. Starting my personal revival, number four, I'm just playing with you. Number four says share. 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 See, when we're happy, we tell everybody. When things are good for us, we tell everybody. And one of the evidences that our heart has grown cold is we don't talk about Christ anymore. Because we ourselves are doubting what God is doing in us. We ourselves, we're saying, well, you know, I'm not sure. So I'm not going to invite somebody if, if I'm not sure. Am I too close to your business? <laughs> Psalm 51, 13 says, David says, God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore that to me. I want to have a willing heart. Sustain me with that. Then verse 13, he says, then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners shall be converted to you. David says, if I'm restored to loving God once again, if I'm restored to having the joy of salvation, I'm going to tell everybody how amazing it is for me because it's going to be good for them. It's going to be good for them. So sharing is an evidence that once again, revival has been restored. If you study any revival, once again, when it started a personal, people confessed there was a conviction and sin and there was a massive outbreak of evangelism massive outbreak of evangelism people went out anywhere they could and told anybody they found about christ because they couldn't contain it they were convinced in their heart that god was doing something amazing within them and david said god if you restore to me the joy of that salvation i'm going to do exactly that i'm going to tell people that are not in you to come back to you i'm going to tell people that are not that are transgressors that are not following your law to stick with the law and continue with you are you with me evidence of that is you see the story of the samaritan woman what did she do when she found jesus she went back to the village brought neighbors cousins the guy she was shacking up with everyone else had to come here from jesus are you with me Everybody came because God wants to reach everybody. She didn't went to get all the holy people from the village. People that need Christ. Are you with me? The same with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus received an encounter with God, Jesus. Jesus have dinner with him at his house. He receives a transformation. The first thing he does is, I'm going to pay everybody what I owe four times. I'm going to do what is right. When there's evidence of the joy of salvation, you cannot hold it inside. You're going to let it out. You're going to share the reality of Christ. I'll end with this verse tonight. It's a verse familiar to us because it's the mandate that God gave our pastors, our senior pastors about our church. Isaiah 12, 3 says, Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Would you read that verse with me? Is that okay? Let's read it together. One, two, three. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Guys, with joy, we will dig it up. With joy, we will find the people that are in need of Christ. With joy, there will be a restoration of the joy of salvation in our heart. If you want to continue in Christ, you're going to have to get fired up for a personal revival in your own life. Four things from Psalm 51 that we saw tonight. Confess, 
accept, God, confess, accept. But number three, because I even forgot it already, that's why I'm repeating it. <laughs> Obey, and number four, share. I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it for you. Number one was confess. Number two was accept. Number three was obey. Number four is share. Do those things and activate a personal revival in your life. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Tonight, before we go out, before we worship, because I want to do that, we have time. Would you give me five minutes of your time? I want to make sure many people left, probably hundreds, um, and maybe some of them need a Christ, but that's okay. Maybe you're here tonight and thinking, I want to make something about what I've heard tonight. I want to know what is the condition of my heart. Before you can have a personal revival, you need God himself in your heart. See, you cannot start a revival in your heart unless you have the originator of that revival. And that is Jesus Christ. He is the one that can restore the condition of your heart this very hour, this very night. But it's your decision. Here's the question we always ask because we want to make sure you know where is your heart and your mind in this process. If you were to die today, if your life ended, done deal. Where would you open your eyes? In heaven or in hell? Most people, large majority of people usually say, pastor, we're going to heaven. As a matter of fact, I was watching uh, a TV and they were interviewing people. And most people, this was the answer. Most people in the mall said, I believe that if you're good enough, you deserve to go to heaven. How misguided. There's no word in the word of God that says that good enough is enough for heaven doesn't say there is no good enough there's no good neighbor or societal standards that say you've done good in life therefore you deserve heaven if it was that simple why did Jesus have to die on a cross why go through all that if all I had to do was behave think about it some people say pastor I'm not just a good person I am also a person that knows about Jesus like you have a lot of understanding here in your head that doesn't convert to salvation in your heart. People say, uh, Pastor, I know about Jesus because especially here in the U.S. and Western countries, we always know about religion. We know about Jesus, the manger. He died on the cross. We celebrate it. We see it all the time. We hear people talk about it. So there is that understanding right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, right here. But not a lot of people have it in here. And this is what Jesus wants. He wants that understanding here. Remember that guy that served the Lord and everything but didn't do it with a loyal heart? God is saying, you can know all kinds of things about me, but you have to know me. So how do I do that, Pastor? Great question. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus made it very clear. Not Paul, not Peter, not John. Jesus himself says, I am the way to heaven. You cannot have a connection with God unless you do it through me. You want a better explanation? There's a man in the book of John named Nicodemus. This man was amazing. This man has a conversation with Jesus at night. And one of the reasons he went at night is because he didn't want his buddies to see him. Why? Because it said he was a, somebody in important in the times of Jesus. See, he was a leader of the church at the times of Jesus. He knew the Bible. As a matter of fact, he needed to know the Old Testament, all the rules and laws of the Old Testament, 600 plus of them. He knew a lot of Bible. Yet it is to that man that Jesus said, for you to go to heaven, you have to be, listen to the words, born again. But when you heard born again, you probably shut down. See, because born again, when you watch TV, movies, all they tell you the same thing. It's just kind of weird looking dorks with glasses and a little Bible under their arms. And so they look all twitchy. That's not born again. Born again is not some kind of attitude thing that I'm at. Born again is the condition of my heart before God. Born again is a commitment that I made to God that I'm going to be in it, all in it, or not at all. As a matter of fact, he makes it even more clear in the book of Revelation. He says, when I come again, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. 
You know what Jesus was saying? Hey, man, you're either in or you're out. Don't play church. Don't play with me. I sacrificed my life for you. This is not a game. This is a true, radical commitment to change for eternity. That's what God wants. See, he gave it. He was all in. But you need to be all in. He didn't go all in so that you can be a quarter in. He's saying it's all or nothing. That's the commitment. That's the calling tonight. How do you connect with that calling? Are you ready? Are you ready? Pay attention. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three, and go like that. When you hear my hands, all that is, is a symbol to you that it's time to raise your hand. Whoa, I got to raise my hand in church. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed. You know what? Jesus was not embarrassed to die publicly for you. As a matter of fact, he says in the book of Luke, hear me well. He says, if you acknowledge me before men... I'm a man, I'll see your hand. I will acknowledge you before my father. But if you deny me, right in the same verse, I'm going to deny you. You know what Jesus is saying? Hey, man, it's simple. I love you. I did my part. You got to do yours. See, because if you're not willing to acknowledge Christ in a safe environment like this, nobody in this place is going to laugh at you. We're going to clap with you. We're going to pray for you, encourage you in your walk. When you get out there, and people question you, you're going to run. God doesn't want that. God wants you to make a commitment and say, I'm in it. I understand it. I need a personal revival in my heart, but I need you first. If that's the condition of your heart, if I describe you tonight, if you know sitting there that you're not walking with Christ and you need to make that commitment today and you need to change where you're at in life, this very moment, tonight is your night. I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, what I want you is I want you to raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, I'm going to pray with you. And we're going to ask Jesus to come into your heart and rescue you tonight from eternal condemnation, eternally being away from God. He doesn't want that. Are you ready? Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, this is your turn to do it. Who should raise your hand? If you know sitting there that you're not walking with Christ and you need to make that commitment tonight, I am asking you to do that tonight. Who should raise their hands tonight? Those who know sitting there, God spoke to you. This is your turn. One, two, three. Is there anybody here? God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Two, three. Is there anyone else in this place? I'm seeing hands, but I kind of don't see. If you're there, wave at me. I know there's more of you today. I see a hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Anyone said, Pastor, you described me. I got to change the condition of my heart tonight. This is your turn to do that. Nobody's forcing you to do it. You have to do it by yourself. This is your commitment with Christ. I've been clear. God has been clear. It's your turn to do it. Is there anyone else tonight in this place? You're saying, gosh, that's me. I have to do that tonight. I have to make a commitment for Christ. If you're not, then maybe you understood this is an all in or out. And I'm okay with that. Because God wants you to be all in. So if you want to do that tonight, this is your turn. I was 13 years old. Listen, as I was 13 years old when I gave my heart to Christ and said, I want to do that. Even though I've been in church all my life. And I remember the two girls sitting next to me, they laughed at me. That's not going to happen to you here. But they laughed at me. I was 13 years old. Man, I was so embarrassed. Guess what? I have never, ever, ever, ever regretted it. Ever. Ever. And I was just a boy. Because it's the right thing to do. I wasn't a coward. I was willing to be all in at 13. You can be all in today. This is your turn. Is there anyone else in this place? This is your moment. I believe there's a few more of you. I feel it in my spirit. I'm just going to let you come when it's ready to come. Those who raise a hand, four or five of you that I was able to see, here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're going to stand. And what I want you to do is if you raise your hand, I want you to be brave enough to meet me down here so we can pray together and encourage you. 
You don't come to Christ just by raising your hand, but by making a commitment in prayer. We're not going to embarrass you. We're going to cheer you on. If you're there, grab your Bible. A friend, if you need a friend, tell them, hey, man, walk with me because that's, you know, I'm new here. Walk with me. They'll walk with you, and we'll pray together. Let's all stand and welcome those who raised your hand tonight. If you didn't raise your hand, you get down here, too, and give your life to Christ. To follow Jesus. This is your day. This is your moment. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. If you raise your hand, go ahead and come down. To follow this is your turn Jesus. with God. Thank you, Lord. No turning back. No turning back. Is there anyone else? This is your moment. If you didn't raise your hand, if you want to come, go ahead and do it. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Amazing. You guys that are up here up front, if you still want to do it, you can go ahead and come. I feel you out there. I'm not going to push you. This is between you and God. I know you're there and you're struggling with it. Make your way down here. You're not going to regret it. If you're up here, this is what we want to do. We want to pray with you because we want you to ask Jesus to come into your heart. That's important. The Bible says that you confess and say, God, I, I need that transformation. Second thing we want to do is we want to offer you an SPT. What is that? Somebody who can help you and walk through this process. We'll explain to you these steps. But the way we're going to do it is Pastor Dave was right there. See him right there. He wants to do that with you. He's going to pray with you. N nothing weird goes on. You know, I trust him a lot. He's a great guy. He's going to pray with you and explain to you what this, what this salvation means. Listen, you made a true decision today. I was as blunt as I've ever been in this, but you made the commitment. And that's important. Now you got to let Jesus start the work in your heart, okay? Follow Pastor Dave. He'll give you that information, pray with you, and you'll be on your way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.